and a very good evening everyone. Welcome in to your box seat. Yes, it is the IRT Inter-Dominion Grand Final Preview Show. Looking forward to bringing you a whole lot of information to get involved. Of course, in association with Woodland Stud, where of the 12 finalists, they have five by their magic sire, Better's Delight. Michael Guerin, it's been a terrific series so far. Plenty of stories in and around each of the heat winners, but dominated by two horses who both started at $6 pre-series and now they're under $2 for the final. Evening to you. Evening Greg, big hot of whale, big hot everybody. Hope you've enjoyed the carnival, I've had a good time. It's been fun, weather's been good and a lot of people have been happy and I think there's been enough interesting storylines to, to give everybody something to chew on. There's been a couple of upsets. It's just been a fun carnival. And I've been to a lot of inter-dominions, I can't remember too many where the spirits were so good. So lots of people feeling happy, but look, we started with 46. Tonight we're going to try and get that down to two. And I think for a lot of people, fellas, they might be the same two. Yeah, you're not wrong there. Great to have you with us again, Craig Thompson, to bring in your analytical skills. We're going to go through a whole lot of videos, talk a whole lot about gate speed, and looking forward to seeing who you find as the winner of each final. Yeah, my evening, boys. Uh, great to be back. I tell you what, um, I made a comment at the start of the series and I got it completely wrong. I said, I don't think there's a horse that can make his own luck in this series and win. Well, I got that completely wrong because Ultimate Sniper's come from terrible draws and won consecutive heats. He gets his best draw this week at barrier number five. I'm going to show you some speed maps tonight for the 2700 metres. Got to surprise a few how a couple get off the gate, Greg, uh, leading into our final. Yeah, looking forward to that information. Let's get straight into where the market sits right now at tab.co.nz. My Kiwi mate heads up the field. Uh, Craig Demler, of course, trains and drives. He is a son of better's delight. He's a $51 chance. Uh, then we get down to the $1.45 favourite ultimate sniper. Mark Shard's been good, but he's 100 to 1 for the final. AG's White Sox, who picked up two of his three heat wins. Uh, Chase Auckland's been second three times through the carnival, $26. He's been crawled by the draw a little bit, as has Cruz Bromac, who beat his stablemate, the Fixer, uh, last time, of course. He's $6, the New Zealand Cup winner. And the Fixer, the Cup winner, from 2018 is a $9.50 chance and has a new driver in the cup winning driver, Blair Orange. But Craig Thompson has a whole lot of speed to look at here for us. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I'm going to go through uh, at least half a dozen runners, starting with my Kiwi, mate. Let's go back to the popular arm. This is a good video to show. The horse that's in the centre of the track, barrier number three, is my Kiwi, mate. And he gets out quite nicely here. He ends up running second now. He's got off the gate OK during the series, and he'll get OK again from barrier one because he's against the market pegs. He should hold up trail three back on the inside, and he's going to be a player. I don't expect him to burn and lead and stay there, but he's a horse that's certainly going to get a nice run. Let's go back and have a look at another one that's got a very good lead and gate speed is Ashley Lokas. This is back in May. The horse at its outside is Alter Orlando. So you can see here they're drawn out wide but it's a small field so it's a little bit uh, dis uh, the, what happens from here is it gets across very easily but there's not a lot of pressure. Hands to Alter Orlando. It's barrier three so it gets out okay again but this is the horse that I think holds the key. On the cards, night one of the Inter-Dominions, in the green here, off the gate, you can see very quickly that it gets across them and does it relatively easily. This is quite a fast front row, gets across Sicario, who's uh, quite quick out, and does it nicely. And then when we go to heat number two, it does exactly the same thing from a similar draw. Now it's got barrier number four, and on the speed maps we've seen so far, it'll get across the inside three. So this is heat number th uh, night three of the Inter Dominions. Barrier four, same draw as it's got in the final. You can see it there in the Thompson colours, not the Barry Purden colours, but in the green, the teal. Gets across them quite nicely. Chase Auckland, who's quick out, is on its inside, but it gets across it. So you can see the good gate speed from this horse, and I think they'll use it. Let's go back to Ultimate Sniper's three-year-old races, that it gets a good draw. Now this is in the sales series from barrier number one. On its outside is Heisenberg, who's a pretty quick horse, but it got off nicely from an inside draw. Now three-year-old form can be not as quick as open class form, but it did do a good job early from a nice draw. Let's go to the Derby, 2700 metres, barrier number two. Uh, on its inside, double rocket. On its outside, better start dreaming. Again, pretty good gate speed here. Not blistering, but enough to get there early and then control the race. So he does have good gate speed, not as quick as on the cards, 
but he's drawn handy enough to get across them. Max Sharp. Now we'll go back to May. This is a horse that's drawn the outside of the gate. Gets across them here along with on the card. So it's a good video to show. Max Shard's drawn eight on the card. Six, relatively equal gate speed, but the one inside it got uh, in front of it, it takes over the race again, Max Shard ends up actually running second, so it's been a horse that certainly can get off the gate when asked, Zachary Butcher has to decide and weigh out what he's going to do. This is AG's White Sox, this is the Taylor Mile, uh, a horse that got barrier one and used its draw to go forward. Now I'm not sure from barrier seven whether they'll look to do that, uh, I think Barry, uh, Barry Purden trained Morris McKendry driven, Morris has got to weigh up his options, is it detrimental to him going forward? and burning and not getting across them, or is he better to go back and get one run at them, Greg? That's the decision that Morris McHenry's got to make. Yeah, that's an awesome insight into the speed off the front row. So from a speed map point of view, how does that look? Well, I think as we look at the map here and the videos that we've shown to you, the most significant horse with the gate speed here is on the cards, and it's drawn to use the draw to go forward. Now, he won't stay there, and he'll more than likely hand to the favourite opposition, and that'll be ultimate sniper. My Kiwi mate, Barrier One's got a position to make, probably trailing or three back early on, and between them we've got Ashley Lokes. The favourite, I think, will posse up Greg, probably a 1-1 one -one or three wide going around the first corner, looking to go forward and I think by the time they get to the winning post probably in front with two rounds to go. All right what do you make of uh, what Craig has come up with there before we have a look at uh, heat number five from last Friday night? I think Craig's right about on the cards I think he's the first leader I think he's got the natural speed to get across the three inside him and I don't think there'd be too much intent there you would think to race him because they're all racing for the same thing the racing to get to the back of Ultimate Sniper. W what I think might be different is this there's, there's two options for the front line for me. Ultimate Sniper is going to try and come across with on the cards and keep the Barry Purden horses, Mark Shard and AG's White Sox wider. Keep them there, she rolls to the top over on the cards. Then you've got a 100 to 1 chance on your back. The other option is this, and we don't often see Natalie Rasmussen extremely aggressive off the gate in these major races. She just dawdles out, happy enough to just stay in front of most of them, make sure the second line horses don't get in front of her, and let them sort themselves out. Now, if the Barry Purden trio, which is obviously Mark Shard coming across as well as AG's White Sox, if on the cards leads and they come across, there's no doubt she'll be handy to them. So the, I think there's two ways of looking at this. Either on the cards leads, Ultimate Sniper comes with them and gets the front, or the Purden three, depending on how they feel and how they're feeling behind the gate, shuffle themselves around and maybe, out of that, AG's White Sox end up in front. And even then, I still think Craig's right. At the winning post, with two laps to go, I think Ultimate Sniper will be in front. And I think a Barry Purden trained runner will be on its back. Let's go back to Friday night and wrap up the two heats that we got to see. Here was a race. Now, down the back at the 800 metre mark, Ultimate Sniper appeared to be in a power of pain. The Aussies were all in front of it, including Colt 31, who gets to the lead here, but I don't even know if Natalie touched him with the stick. It was more rain. He just picked up Chase Auckland in the last 50 metres and could not have been more impressive, Michael. It didn't stun me that he got past the Australian horses because they were tired. They actually got tired at the top of the straight and Colt 31 did a good job to keep going to the line. What's impressive is that Chase Auckland had sat on the fence and hadn't covered any extra ground and this horse had covered a lap of extra ground in 3.16 and change and then got to him. So obviously we know staying's not an issue. He's been three wide for at least a lap in every race of the series. So Craig, when you look at that, and you take him back from three wide and put him all the way over here next to the marker pegs, his life's about to get a lot easier. Well, all of, of us, all his draws, we just showed that there, that he's definitely got the best of the three rounds so far. He, he, he'll go forward. It's how much he has to work to get there. I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Michael. It'll be a Barry Purden runner that'll be in, in front of him uh, early on. I'm thinking it's on the cards. I, I'm not convinced AG's White Sox is going to roll the dice. I think Morris McKendry will sum it up pretty early. He may have a dig for 50 metres, but I think there's a lot of gate speed there, Greg. And if you burn at both ends, uh, you're a sitting duck to get swamped. And I think AG's White Sox, what we've seen so far, the best version of it is when it comes with one run. Here's a question for you both. Everybody watching at home, you're going to see a, a lot of selections later on where a lot of people are going to pick the same horse. How does Ultimate Sniper get beaten? What needs to happen here 
for him to get beaten? I think there's got to be a lot of pressure on the race. What, what, what I would say is if you go back to the third night of the carnival, it took her an awful long time to get round the field. Now, she said they were rolling along, but they're going to roll along in the final as well. Everyone's playing for $500,000, so it's not a given that they're just going to hand straight away. Everyone's looking to posse into the right spot. They're all trying to get to the market pegs. So it does depend on what my Kiwi mate Zakaria, the two Aussies, do inside on the cards. We're all thinking it'll get there, but... It's, again, not a given that he'll get there straight away. So it could take a lot longer for her to work to the front. That would allow, allow a horse possibly like Cruz Bromac, who's probably be the horse of the series so far that you've said could work in his race and still be there at the finish. He did that on night one. He did that on night three. I think he's a horse that's certainly going well. If you've said to me, Michael, post the draw, had he drawn inside Ultimate Sniper, could he have beaten him? I suggest he could. He's lost that advantage by the draw. Yeah, Barry Purden's team holds the key. They're, they're the difference between Ultimate Sniper just rolling to the front, dictating the final, and running away and hiding. If those drawn outside of on the cards, obviously AG's White Sox is the absolute key because I think he's the best of their three. There's no doubt about that at all. We'll go back to heat number six, though. So I think that's how he gets beaten. The only way I can see him getting beaten. Here's Cruz Bromac. Head popped out, gone back around the fixer. And when he's on the markers, as we saw in the New Zealand free-for-all last year, Michael, he's really hard to get past. I think, I think he's a better horse now than he was this time last year. I'm sure of that. Uh, he, he, again, had he drawn, as Craig said, to sit on the leader's back or lead massive winning chance. He is going to have to come three wide at some stage, almost certainly be parked or 1-1, because I think when they start moving from the back, I think they'll come in a bunch. No, they'll not let one horse go and just sit there. I think Cruz Bromac, Chase Auckland, has to get away from the marker pegs, because otherwise he'll be five deep. And the fixer, I think they'll come together. And then when they come, it depends who ends up where. One will be one, one, one parked. Maybe San Carlo is the same thing. He's still going to cover three or four more lengths than a horse who has been, not by much, but marginally better than him in the series, or way better than them, if that's the way you want to shop. Either way, I doubt he can do that, unless there's a lot of pressure that first lap, and I don't see it. I see there being pressure for the first 400, and I, I, I get these things wrong a lot, but I just can't see any way Ultimate Sniper doesn't roll to the front, and then can pretty much do what it wants for the next lap. All right, the key was on Sunday, the barrier draw and how it unfolded. And coming up with the plum draw was, of course, the Aussie, my Kiwi mate. When you got out of bed this morning, uh, I think you would have been pretty happy if someone had said, mate, take barrier one and go back to bed. Yeah, I would have been right with that, Mick. Uh, no, I'm right with the draw and it's, it, it's great that the horse can actually get a good draw in a race like this. He seems the type of horse who, the harder they go, the better it will suit him. Yeah, look, he is a super horse like that. He seems to just thrive on the racing. I, I, I'm surprised how good he actually handles it because, um, like, after every heat, he just seems to pull up super. And you go and work him, and he's pulling you around. He's, you know, travelling, travelling, like gone to Queensland and New Zealand in the past. The horse seems to thrive on that. Um, and look, on Saturday night, I hope they do go really hard um, because, yeah, he can he can be thereabouts for sure. Yeah, being in on the mark is a horse that's nearly won 350000 We know him well. He's been to the park before in the four-year-old uh, features, and he's a great follower of speed. Yeah, and there is, look, there's the minuscule hope Craig could hustle and bustle off the gate and maybe hold. I just don't see it happening, but I don't want to totally discount it because the Australian horses tend to have good gate speed, but I, I just don't think it's going to happen. So everybody's thinking he's three or four deep on the inside. From there, really, really hard to see him winning, but great first four trifecta chance and more importantly paying back to four on the place tote Greg I know you found him there so I think that's a realistic option for him and to be honest I think where Craig is at with this horse and knowing the horse so well I think he'd be happy enough to say hey we were in third or fourth in the final because he's probably in that bunch of horses and it's an, a decent sized bunch who are between five and ten in the mm. series there's a bunch of them there who are probably not much between them well and he's the one who got the magic carpet of barrier oh, one? Absolute magic carpet getting barrier one because had you put him second row, he's 151 shot. He's, he's 51 now because he's got barrier one and he will end up three the fence, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, he hasn't run past many horses in the series, but again, I think the 2,700 metres following is his key, and he's going to get that opportunity on a Saturday night. But uh, I think he's, again, like Michael said, they're paying back to fourth. My best rifle would be Max Shard. 
just going back looking through the videos. His run last week was absolutely magnificent. He actually clocked the best sectionals out of the race, and we won't talk about him a lot in this show, but I think he's a horse that certainly if you're playing to the first, remember $10,000 going to those first fours for both finals, he'd be one that I'd certainly consider. I think Zachary Butch will work this race out pretty well. Yeah, she went great last uh, Friday night. I got a chance on Sunday to catch up with the former trainer, co-trainer, of course, of AG's White Sox, still uh, part owns this horse, and just got a feel from uh, Greg Hope about what it means to have a horse in the Inter-Dominion final. He's going super up there, couldn't be happier. His last start was, uh, was amazing, really. I think they clocked him home at 53-1 uh, or something, so, you know, he's three wide doing it. Um, yeah, no, he's in the right uh, vein of form, I think. Yep, he sure is, and he's vindicated what you've been saying for... Uh, you talk about the problems you've had with Mon Bay. Whilst they've been structural, this has obviously been an internal issue that you guys have had to work extremely hard to get right. Yeah, most, most of the good horses you all have issues and it's only the good ones you get to hear about really. It's, um, but yeah, no, he, he seems as though he's in the right, um, right form now. Barry, quite rightly, said to us, look, I've only driven him once and that was on the Wednesday, so he wasn't taking any of the credit, but I guess when you see his colours out there on your horse, it only enhances your, your, your confidence and, and of course Morris McHenry, second on the all-time list of drivers, um, you got a few ticks there. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, no. Barry, Barry's been round that track a few times. Uh, Morris has too. So, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, um, we couldn't afford to be away that long with uh, with the horse, and um, we get a big enough cut of the cherry if he gets the money. So it, it won't worry us paying out ten percent to Barry. What's it like watching it at home? I know you guys are going to head up for the final, and so you should. And I'm, I'm pleased you are going. But how different is it when someone else is handling your horse? And, and basically, I know when they go out on the track, it's out of your hands anyway. But um, what's it been like for you and Nina? Oh no, it's been great, great watching. Really, not having to do the work and getting him out there. But I mean. The fact that he got beaten the other day, we were thinking, shit, if he wins three, we, we might jinx him, we might be able to go for the final, but we can definitely go up and have a look now. We're not going to jinx him unless he got beaten. Yeah, I think they've been thoroughly vindicated, Michael, as to what they've been saying for the last 12 months. There's something not quite right, there's something not quite right. They've got that sorted now, and we're seeing the product that they knew they had at home. And it's not just about Saturday night either. Like, he's got an Auckland Cup, he could go to a Hunter Cup, he could potentially go to a Miracle Mile Carnival. We need him back in open class because there's not that many good open class horses who aren't trained by the All-Stars. And people sometimes get jack of that conversation. So it's it's good to have him and, and Steve Telfer having triple weight and, and these other moving parts in the series. So, yeah, it's good to have him back um, regardless of what happens Saturday night for me. Now, morning's not a great time of the day for you, but no. this morning you managed to get out of bed nice and early and uh, head to book a co and catch up with the All-Stars team. And here's what Mark Purden had to say about his charges for the Inter-Dominion Grand Final. Well, Mark, we saw most of the Inter-Dominion horses work this morning and it all looked pretty good. Yeah, very happy with the morning's work. Mark, uh, nothing disappointed us. They're all where they should be. Cruz Bromac sprinted up the straight with Ultimate Sniper. Happy with them both? Happy with them both, yes. They, they got home at probably 28 and, and both felt good doing it. Earlier, we saw uh, the Fixer working along and he was just asked to sprint up the straight too, but he came off the back of them pretty well. Yes, he did, yeah. He made good work, uh, good ground late in, in the workout, and uh, yeah, so he's in a good place too. Of your other Inter Dominion pacing finalists, we didn't see Ashley Lokes or Chase Auckland this morning. Why is that? Uh, we just train them a little bit differently. They do a little bit more work on their off days, so they have a canter on their off days. So uh, after the three runs in a week, we just uh, I just thought the two hobble runs would probably do them. John Dunn is driving Ashley Lokes. He hasn't driven the horse yet. Will he get a feel of him before Saturday night? Yep, John will be out in the morning and uh, he'll have uh, his last hobble run, Ashley Lokes, with him and get the feel of him. We also saw this morning Self Assured, who's in a support race on Saturday night. Uh, he looks very forward for a horse we haven't seen at the track for a while. He is forward, Mick, and uh, he had a trial last week and I was pleased with that, but he's come on from that and uh, his work this morning was very good. If I asked you to put in order maybe the first three of your five for the Inter-Dominion Pacing Championship, what order would you put them in? Uh, Ultimate Sniper would be number one, and especially now the draws come out. Um, Cruise Bromac number two, and the Fixer number three. 
That's probably of no surprise that Mark's put them in that order. I think just about everyone uh, would put them in that order. What we've got now is some footage of their work from this morning. Right, Michael, you were there. Cruz, Bromac and Ultimate Sniper here. Obviously the sniper at the back with the shadow row on and um, talk me through their work. Yeah, so Gallopy Pacemaker in front, it pulls off to the outside of the track, Cruz Bromac in front, and he's a naturally good track worker. There's Ultimate Sniper chasing him down. They buzz up the straight, they're not asked for too much, but they hit the line together. Now, Cruz Bromac, you would, would think, would just be a naturally more zippy type of a horse. Ultimate Sniper was all business, though. He sweated up a lot beforehand, he's a black horse, he's obviously quite a robust horse, so that didn't surprise me. There's still a lot of gear on. What was most important is, Pukakoe is flatter and tighter than Alexandra Park. And he, he handled the bends, no issue. So if you're worried about him getting a bit hoppy and skippy in the past, he has um, sometimes. Uh, he just cruised around those bends at, at a decent speed and was able to come off the back of the other horse without touching a knee, without looking silly. They hit the line together. So even if you say it's comparable work, gentlemen, one of them's more than likely going to be in front and the other one's going to be covering more ground. So... Oh, if Cruz Bromac could put a length on him, it wouldn't have surprised me because he's such a naturally athletic horse. He looks fantastic, Cruz Bromac. What There's sort no, of work no did you make of that? Oh, I think they're, they're probably relatively easy runs. They obviously weren't uh, let go too hard, only four days or three days out from the final. What I would tell you is looking through their birdcage presence last uh, Friday evening, what I noticed is horses come through the series one way or the other. They just keep improving or they go the other way. And we've seen that in, in, in quite a few cases. Both Ultimate Sniper and Cruz Bromac have not had the effects of three, even though they've had hard runs, they've paraded really bright, they've kept improving right through the series. Um, and I just thought that on that work there, looking at Cruz Bromac again, it looked very bright going to the line. So I think both of these horses, even though they've had tough runs, are not feeling at the moment. I tell you, you can see this morning, well, with all the All Stars horses, and, and when you think about it in your own life, if, if you were going for a run with people you were faster than, you're going to recover better than them because you're not straining as hard. Mm. So, yeah, I saw horses like Star Galleria at the track this morning, and they've had a harder series because they've been in oxygen deck quicker, and they've had to hurt themselves more mm. each day of the trip. Mm. Now, while Ultimate Sniper's had a busy time, Greg, sitting three wide in each race, he's probably the best horse in the series. So these all-star horses have been really fit. I spoke to Natalie about that. So they've arrived fit. But because they are among the best horses in the series, they're not hitting the line tired. They're not hitting the line, hitting the wall at the 400. So they're coming through the series so much better. Mm -hmm. I saw virtually all of their good horses this morning and there wasn't one you'd go, mm, he's lightened off a touch, there's a bit of rib there, or he looks a bit ratty. They all look superb, as horses tend to do in summer, but none of them, when they all worked, and we saw the ball, none of them dropped off, hit a knee, were throwing their you know, head in the air. They were all professional and inch perfect all morning. I think you're fine with these races. You've got three races in the spaces of seven days, and then you've got eight days to get them into the final. So um, some horses can handle three hard runs, Greg. Those two that we saw work there definitely have done it. Let's have a look at the fixer. You could argue that he's improved through the series as well, given what he did, Michael, at the Cup Carnival uh, a month ago. And this is him at the back of the field with uh, Natalie Rasmussen aboard. And, yeah, it was pretty nice work from him to understand. Yeah, so, and again, the galloping pacemaker. Now, he sat last the whole way. And, and then you have another masterpiece to the insider self-assured who of course we see returning in a later race on Saturday. And there's the little fix with his head down, coming down the outside. Again, they hit the line together. The one thing to take out of this, good work. Another, uh, the fixer hitting the line well, but the fixer is race fit. Another masterpiece is race fit and self assured right alongside them without a race under his belt for the last month or six weeks. So he's very short to win his other race on Saturday night. And is looking but likely to go to an Auckland car. Yeah, they, they mentioned that to me today. That So the one thing I would say is Ultimate Sniper, <clears throat> maybe not an Auckland Cup, by no means guaranteed. Cruz Bromwick and the Fixer, yes. But on that, the Fixer, very good. But he didn't impress me any more than he has in the past or during the series. The one thing I took out of that was both Ultimate, uh, both Self Assured and another masterpiece who drop enormously back in class for support races on Saturday night are where they need to be too, because they were right alongside the fixer. Another of the Aussie charges Michael Guerin caught up with at the barrier draw on Sunday was Beck Bartley talking about San Carlo. Well, how's Big Murray handled the series? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I think he's handled it pretty good. Um, I just don't know if he's mentally adjusted to going this way. Like he is a really big, um, you know, you got to get him mentally right for these things. And um, I still think uh, we haven't seen his best yet. Okay, barrier two on the second line. I presume that put you in the running line at some stage and then a chance to, to take off if you feel like it. Yeah, it leaves us with a few options. Um, you know, it's probably not too bad because we don't have to burn him out the gate now and we're, we're in the running line. So, um, yeah, it's probably, yeah, it's not too bad at all. And I believe that it isn't too bad and I think she will definitely put Murray into the race. I think it's almost a perfect draw for him. Doesn't have to get involved early, ends up in the running line. She can move when she feels like it. Probably wants to move in front of the you know, Fixer or Cruz Bromac if she can. I think it's been great to have the Australians here. I think they've really made the series. I don't think any of them can probably win the final. And that's no disrespect to Sicario or my Kiwi mate or San Carlo. I just think these aren't the best versions of Australian Open class horses we've seen and they're up against some pretty darn good horses. But this would have been a very bland series without what they brought to it. And I, I think that a lot of them have enjoyed it too. I think a lot of the Kiwis have enjoyed meeting them. So the Inter-Dominions tends to build a lot of relationships. And there's Beck Bartley, who I don't think many people had seen on television in this country six weeks ago. And she's really embellished her reputation here, as has Stephen O'Donoghue, a guy I'd never met, Greg, and I've got nothing but respect for now. So I wish them all the best of luck. I just... I don't see how they can win the final. Well, you know what it meant to him when we spoke to him mm. on the Tuesday night. Just to get to the, the final. Game. He was just wrapped to get into another final. And now we've got $100 to spend, very much like we did at the Cup meeting. How would you spend your $100 in the final? Huh? Well, I, I think Ultimate Snipe will win it, but I'm not going to put $100 at $1.40. So we've got to find some value into the trifecta. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking the two main dangers through the series have been both AG's White Sox and Cruz Bromac. So I've worked on the favourite to win those two to run second, add a little bit of value into the uh, trifectas with the likes of uh, Max Shard running in there, put in the fixture if they go very, very hard, but that's a $10 trifecta, uh, two, one horse to win, two for second, six for third, and play for a $10 unit. Right, what, what about for you, Michael? I was, I was torn between, this sounds crazy, $100 a place on on the cards, because I think he'll be in the trail potentially, or three back on the inside, and they pay back to fourth. That's a huge difference. Fourth and third doesn't sound like much, it's huge. Working in this race is going to be tough if all of us not the leads. But I do think Natalie may be neutral off the gate. I think AG's White Sox might follow the other Purden runners across, get the front, hand ultimate sniper. So my $100 bet would be AG's White Sox ultimate sniper Quinella. Well, if that unfolds, it's going to be difficult for my man, my Kiwi mate, to get himself into the top three, but he could get into the top four. So I'm happy to have the $100 on. He's at five fifty at the moment, Michael. $5.50. And it also depends on, with, without being rude, whether you're a $10 punter or a $1,000 punter. If you're a $1,000 punter, you may well want to have your 1000 at 1.45. And that's good money and you enjoy it. At $10, that probably gets you a free cappuccino, which probably isn't quite as exciting. But I, I think that everybody's going to pick Ultimate Sniper. A lot of people are going to be doing first fours and stuff. I wouldn't be stunned if Ultimate Sniper led Cruz Bromac, the fixer came around and All-Stars ran one, two, three. What, I wouldn't be surprised by that. What do you think of the market at the moment at $1.45? I mean, I think it's pretty fair. And people are going to say, well, hey, gee, $1.45, how can you take that? It, it, but I don't think you'll get much better. Inter Dominions are vastly different from other races because there's a lot of Gallup's followers and Greyhound followers and people who'll be betting it to Rapa on Saturday for the big race there, the Waikato Cup, and they'll sit down and they'll watch it. Mm. And when they watch it, just like, for example, when Catalyst. a harness racing person watches mm. Sydney racing, they go, Chris Waller, J-Mac. Mm. Those people will go, Mark Bird, Natalie Rasmussen, beautiful, I'll just back that. They will gravitate towards the big stables any time you have those mega big races because that's the people they know. Yep, that is uh, correct. As we go to a break, we're not far from having a look at the trotting grand final, but here's some action from the barrier draw from Alexandra Park on Sunday. We have a fair and keenly contested race. Bugger! <laughs> you will absolutely certainly forget to bring that back on this. Oh no, that doesn't look good. Oh, it's not too bad. There we go. There is a happy girl. Oh, that's any good. Barry 11. Whoa, what about that?
Some good action from this morning's work as we build towards the IRT Inter Dominion Grand Finals. It's the HR Fiskin and Sons Inter Dominion Tropping Grand Final is the second of our big goes on Saturday night. It'll start at 19 minutes past eight, and we have a dollar ninety favourite in Winterfell. He's been the find of the series, winning a couple of the heats. As has Temporale. One's got the front row draw of two, the other won the second row. Habibi Inter twenty six dollars. The start of the series, there was certainly nothing like that. Tough Monarch, of course, the free for all winner and runner up in the Dominion, Paramount King who took out the first heat at around a similar price to what he is for the grand final. And Massive Metro, who's also a $26 chance. The man to talk us through what's going to happen early though, Craig Thompson, what are we expecting in the trotting final? Yeah, let's go and have a look at uh, Big Jack Hammer from Barrier One. Now this is uh, the first night's heat. Gets out nicely, you can see it holding up from the inside. Temporarily comes across with it. But it got out relatively good enough to suggest that from barrier one over 2,700 metres, it'll do enough to be in the mix early. I do think there's a couple quicker than it, but from that draw, it's going to put itself in the right spot, and that'll probably be the trail early on. Let's go and have a look at Winterfell. Let's go back to the four-year-old Jules. Now, Sunny Sun's in here. Winterfell's out wide. He's in the black colours. Again, we haven't seen him drawn off the front that often, but when he does draw handily, he's not too bad off the gate here. Sunny Sun beat him out, but he was pretty good. He comes across them, and he tends to roll, and he'll tend to roll pretty well over 2,700 metres on Saturday. He's a major factor from a good draw at barrier number two. Here, what I think is the fastest horse off the front line. This is heat number two, uh, second night of the Inter Dominions. The horse Majestic Man draws barrier number four. Gets across them very easily. You'll see what a foul out wide from five, pokes in into the 1-1, one, one. but Majestic Man dominated them in front over the sprint journey on uh, the second night, Greg, and from there was far, far too good. Now, he's got a horse, he's a horse that has a lot of speed. He's got a good draw to use it. In saying that, I think over 2,700 metres, he's probably more potent with a sit. Brad Williamson has to make the decision. Does he hand to the favourite or does he stay in front? All right, let's have a look graphically at what may happen uh, when the gate rolls on uh, Friday night. One I did want to ask you about, and... It showed plenty of speed in the second round of heats. Bonnie Highlander, do you, you don't see it coming off at all? Uh, I think it may come off, but I can't see him getting across. This is how we've mapped him, and it doesn't always become an exact science, but Majestic Man from four, we think's your early leader. Big Jack Hammer from the inside, showed enough gate speed in the heats to be a major player and possibly your trailer. Now, there's Winterfell and Destiny Jones between the two. Uh, Winterfell's good out, but not blazing out. Valoria outside, Majestic Man. Markula, well, you don't know with him, Greg. He hasn't shown the gate speed so far to use it, and he's in a tricky position at barrier number eight. I think the best version of Markula is when he's happy. Uh, he's going to have to go very quickly to get across them from out wide. I suggest maybe the safer option is to tuck him in and then look to roll at one stage. OK, let's go back to last Friday night and have a look at the last two heats. Michael Guerin, Temporale. He has performed with great distinction through this series. Been well trained by Bernie and Michelle, and look, here he is. He totally dictated the terms in front. He, he was going to win this a long way from home. Paramount King, very good. Markula, excellent. Tough Monarch, better. But uh, Markula, had he drawn the front line, most people would have seen him as potentially one of the leaders. He's one on the second line. Not a disaster. I see him being three probably more likely four back on the inside. And from there, he's going to need a lot of things to go his way to win. Temporale, you mean? Yeah, that's what I mean, Temporale. Yep. I, I don't see him as a big winning chance, but I do see him as a horse who could absolutely go a boomer and run second, third or fourth, but he might have to run past six horses in the last 400. Not saying it's impossible, but the key to him is a really hot tempo, so the outside running line stops drop, starts and, dropping. And when off. he won his row cup, he was three defence. Three defence, yeah. yeah. So he's going to get a nice run through, and, and more than likely maps a three defence, and he shouldn't have to go round a horse. But the best version of Temporale is when you'd like to see him 
uh, a little bit handier than that, and he's going to have to rely on big, uh, big Jack Hammer in front of him. But so, you, if you're saying he's going to be three fence, but so you're thinking so he follows that big Jack Hammer who yeah. pushes it, and we think Majestic Man gets across. Yeah, him. four That's, fence probably. Yeah, okay, so four fence. Yeah, could also three fence early, four fence yeah. probably mid stages. So he's going to be lucky. Oh. Well, put that put seven or eight horses in front of you starting yeah. the last six hundred. That, that, that's where the tempo is important. Isn't not it? ideal. He, he's been he's been the big loser out of the draw because he's such got good gate speed. He saw that through the heats. But if they're going at three twenty speed and you're on the markers, you've told us several times, yeah. markers, markers, markers. It could be a huge advantage. A horse that we think will be on the markers and in front went three twenty last week. His name is Winterfell, and he was in the zone last Friday night, Michael. It's fine. Look, he was. Every Inter Dominion has one or two horses, Ultimate Sniper has been one of the others, who just end up mentally and physically right. He is the one in the trotting series, probably along with Paramount King. Like, he actually does this very easily. Massive Metro's the former national record holder, and he's beating him pointlessly. Majestic Man, I'm wanting to forgive, Brad attacked in the middle stages. It didn't work out. He didn't knock the horse around at all. But about three weeks ago, Greg, you said to me, what do you like in this series? I said, don't bet into this market. Too many moving parts, don't bet into this market. I've said it for three weeks in a row. Don't bet into this market, don't bet into this market. Now you can bet. The, exp the form's been exposed. We've seen a couple of horses lose form, Habibi Inter. We've seen a whole bunch of horses here really crawled by the draw of the second line. So those six or seven or eight winning chances diminish, diminish, diminish. Then you get back to Winterfell. And the reason I've been dirty on Winterfell for the last year is not his ability. When he finishes three-year-old season, I thought to myself, he could be a champion, but he dogged it. The reason he's been beaten so many times isn't her ability. He's dogged it about five or six times, maybe six or seven times. And that's what I hate. I hate horses who dog it. But when you see the proof, you've got to look at the proof. And the proof in the last two weeks has been that he is a happy horse. We've seen it in the racetrack. We saw it this morning on the training track. Galloping pacemaker in front. He's the horse sitting in the trail behind him are one change and flying even better. Two very slippery three-year-olds who could easily pace a mile on 152. Now you look at them here, there's no mucking around with the ears, there's no trotting roughly, there's no hanging, there's no being basically a dick. He is acting like a total pro. Three-year-olds come off his back, here he is to the line. Strong, efficient, no mucking around, and two very good three-year-olds, admittedly not being pushed, mm. but they couldn't get him. He was good on night one, better on night two when Mark looked after him, perfect last week, and this morning chasing a galloping pacemaker. And this time last year is every chance he would have rolled into a gallop. In fact, four starts ago, he could have beaten 133 lengths in a race. Mm. You know, like that, that's well, him. he did it at Ashburton in the exactly. mile, and then he did it in the New Zealand exactly. free form. But, free form. but mm. he's a totally different horse. He's came here and he's proved to us he's the horse to beat. Now it's a case that if he either gallops or underperforms, they can beat him. If they rough him up, maybe they can beat him. But if he rolls to the front, I don't see how they beat him. Craig, are you liking what you've seen? Oh, I like what I saw there. I, I mean, I, I'm not clocking them. I'm not sure what they've run their last quarter and or whether they've just run up the lane there. I'm sure he's beaten the other two three-year-olds who probably run up the lane as well, and they weren't asked to run as well. But the good thing was he trotted very nicely, and he's in, uh, in the zone at the moment. He hasn't looked like breaking, uh, certainly like uh, free-for-all day, but he's a horse that I can never completely 100% trust. Now, three runs at Alexandra Park, three weeks, Perfect, hasn't put a foot wrong, never looked like galloping. But Winterfell has that 1% in him that can do something wrong. And uh, whether he does that on, on Saturday night, I'm not sure. I think he deserves to start favourite. Is he past the post? Absolutely not. Craig, it was a funny thing this morning. As you know, I hate morning time. It's a despicable time of the day. And well, you I, don't get up before 11, right? No, I know. I got up at 10 past 6 this morning. I thought to myself, I, I should just roll over and say the car's broken. But it was actually really worth going there to see a whole lot of different things how efficient the business was that works out there. But he was the thing which I got, when I got in the car to come back, it was like, wow. And now I've never been the biggest fan of the horse for what he has been doing mentally for such a long period of time. I'd have to and thought, wow. And I had the same feeling in 2005 with Al Sue. I've traveled to a couple of interdoms with Lazarus and, and you know, Black's a fake where you go, oh, right, you're on the zone. Mm. And Big Poy, who travels with their horses. Matt Bowden. Yeah, Matt yep. Bowden, does the galloping pacemaker. He came back afterwards, he's just shaking his head. He said, he's in the zone. He just loves it up here. Mm. And that's where he's at. So I agree with you. There's percentage points, which could be 1% sometimes to 50%. He could gallop. But um, everything I've seen during this carnival has been good, better, 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 to virtually perfect. 
and I think he can probably maintain that to Saturday night. All right, what about his co-trainer and driver? What did he think? Well, Mark, there's the work of Winterfell with two of your very good three-year-old paces, and he looks faultless. Yeah, he's trotting very good. He's, he's more comfortable this way around, but he's turned the corner mentally too, Mick, and uh, he's just a different horse now. People watching at home tonight are going to think, OK, can we trust him? He was working behind a galloping pacemaker this morning and he looked very trustworthy. <laughs> yeah, he was very good this morning. And as I say, he's more comfortable this way around. So in his races, he's, he has been good. Uh, the first night he got a bit rocky early, but uh, the other two nights he's been faultless. You got barrier two on Saturday night. Uh, I presume you would like to be in front at some stage. Does he have the gate speed to get there immediately? Or are you thinking there might be one or two who might cross him? Look, I'll be asking him to come out, and he's, uh, you know, he's felt safe out of the mobile. So, uh, you know, ideally it'll be nice to be in front uh, going into that first first turn. He went 3:20 for 2,700 last week. It's a national record. Can he go quicker on Saturday night? Well, he could go quicker if he had to. Yes. That's pretty scary. When he's suggesting he could go quicker than that, and yes, he did it under his own steam the other night. But if he goes quicker and he's on the mark, as Michael. Mathematically, you can't be beaten. Well, it's scary for those horses off the markers. Um, there a couple of updates, and shortly we're going to hear from one of the great guys of New Zealand trotting. He did an interview with Ken Ford uh, on, on Sunday. I had a really long talk to Phil Williams, and I know you have too, and he has said, look, basically, I want Brad to blast the gate with Majestic Man and lead, and then point blank, we want to hand up. Because we think if the pressure comes from all those good horses on the second line, we have a good chance of getting Winterfell for speed which is one scenario. Had a conversation with Barry Purden tonight, and he said, as we thought might happen, he said, Mark Cordell is putting weight back on. He got up here, a bit light, as they get from travelling, had three runs in a week. Cherie's done the right thing by the horse. He said, happy, happy with the horse. I'm looking forward to driving in tomorrow morning. What do you make of Barry 8? He said, I'll be telling Cherie to go forward. And that really surprised me. I thought they would go back in the Dominion now. Work into the race. Exactly. Yeah. And, and Barry doesn't tend to give instructions, but he said, look, why go back and get behind all those other horses and have to get around them? So if you're thinking Majestic Man puts a little bit of pressure on Winterfell and then Mark Hall puts a little bit of pressure on him, all of a sudden it's not just Winterfell jogging to the front to win. I, I think he probably will end up in front, but if one or two other horses or Bonnie Hollander roll the dice, then Winterfell might have to think. And that's when a dollar ninety may not feel that comfortable. Well, as you're about to hear, win, lose or draw, they've made it. They've made it to the grand final, the Ford family. And here's what Ken thinks of having a runner in an Inter Dominion final. Ken, explain to me what it means to you and the family to have an Inter Dominion finalist. Well, it means everything, Greg. You know, we're uh, we're just so wrapped to be there. It really, is it's just exciting as hell. Let's talk about Mark Calder and the way he's come through the series and the way your granddaughter's handled him and obviously the way Barry Purden's looked after him. Yeah, well, you know, you couldn't get anywhere better than Barry. Like, Mark might be the best, but Barry taught him, didn't he? Yeah. And uh, I've always felt that. And, you know, to have Sri there, she's doing things right, and we're sort of thrilled with that. You've had two ones, and now you've got two eights, and you've got eight in the final, of course, barrier draw-wise. But um, just getting to the final is your Everest, isn't it? Yeah, well, the horse owes us nothing, you know. Like we're, we're, we're there, we're in it, and I'm just going to make the most of it, you know. Yep, you're heading north. It's a real family occasion, but Amanda won't be there because she wants to qualify one on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, she reckons the last chance before getting to Nelson, so she's going to try and qualify a maiden trotter, yeah. Doesn't that sum the family up? Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah. <coughs> All right, what will it mean when you get to Alexandra Park? How much will you enjoy this moment? Oh, it'll be ma massive, you know, I'm going to really, really... Clint's got a couple of his mates going up with him, so we won't be on our own, yeah. Win, lose or draw, you'll have a beer and you'll, and you'll celebrate the night, won't you? It doesn't matter where we get, <clears throat> we're there, you know. That's it, we're, we're there, I never dreamt in my wildest dreams I'd ever get a horse to the end of the minions. And used to watch them on TV when I was dairy farming and think about them, but hell, you know. Yeah, this is just something else. That summed it up for me, and, and that's what it means to a family that have been in the sport all their lives, to have a runner in the grand final. It, it is, it's, it's a huge deal. I need to ask you, was he wearing braces? Were they braces? It was a little bit of Jed Clampett, I, I know, like that's it. what you were thinking. I thought that was awesome, <laughs> yeah. Ken. I want you to wear the braces on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. but you they might what? be lucky. It means a bunch to a whole lot of people. I spoke to Josh and John Dickey this week, and, and I was so thrilled because 
you don't get horses in these very often. And John Dickey said to me, I thought it was gone, the Inter Dominion. 2012 was gone, and this has been a huge part of his life, and he wasn't going to get a chance to win it again. And now he's on his home track with the chance to win it. And a guy like Ricky Elchin's come across here and had an amazing month. And we, we got a chance to speak to him um, at the battery draw on Sunday. Well, the week got better than how it started. Yeah, that's right. We're in it. That's the main thing. Um, barrier 11, um, it's not the end of the world. I mean, we won't be in the early speed battle, so Ants will just have to make a few decisions at the right times. And I suppose you're hoping they go hard up front. Definitely. He needs the speed on. Um, you know, if, if they go slow and you know, he's back, well, he might struggle a little bit on that bend coming wide, but if the speed's on, he will be running home. Who's the horse to beat? Just off the draw, Winterfell, obviously, drawn two. Um, even a horse like Temporale is going to get a cosy run. He's been really good right through the series. And then you look at Majestic Man. Um, you know, they're, they're all going to be on the pace. Um, so, you know, if the speed's on, but my horse will be running home. Yeah, he's had a great month, hasn't he, in New Zealand, uh, enjoying Cup Week and now enjoying the chance to have a runner in the grand final, as does Josh and uh, John Dickey. Here's what Josh had to say. You got a second line barrier draw, Josh, but he seemed to handle coming from back in the field pretty good on night two. Well, he did really, Mick. Um, it's not an ideal barrier draw, but you know it is what it is, and I trust that they'll go hard at, during the race, and you know that should benefit him. How's he copped the three runs in a week? Looks surprisingly really well. Um, something I guess everyone's a little bit nervous to worry about their horse going through the series, and um, you know he had to put up a New Zealand record the first night, and you know getting through that, um, we couldn't be happier to be honest. Must be a big thrill for you and your dad, home track, and it's your, your new home track. Of course, Cambridge used to be the home track, to have a really good horse in the final. It is really, mate. You know, um, we had, you know, speeding spare over the last couple of years, and you know that was a lot of fun. And you know, when you lose him out of your stable, it's you're sort of looking for the next one. And you know, we're really pleased to um, have this fella step up to the plate and you know put his hand up. And look, I know that going forward, even after the series, that you know he could be a serious trotter in the making. And I'm sure that that is going to be right as well. $100 spend here, boys. Craig? Well, I've gone outside the favourite here. Um, I've been a majestic man right through this series. A, a couple of reasons why. I, I think for sheer speed, there's very few horses that can go with him. Um, he, he reeled a 54-6 half in the heats to win. Um, I think from the draw, it puts him in front of Winterfell here. I think Winterfell will come round, and I think he'll sit on his back. So then it becomes, can he run him down? I think depending on what speed they go, I think Mark's going to try and roll him as hard as he can and take the speed out of Majestic Man. But I like that he's in the zone at the moment. I was very worried that he wouldn't get through three rounds into a final. Uh, suggest coming sitting parked in a New Zealand record run last Friday night that he's come through pretty well so far, Greg. So 50 a win on him, $50 Quinella, a lead trail scenario. Just with that win bet, would you wait for the tote? Because he's 330 oh, I, I, I think you'll get, get out to closer to $4. $4. Yeah. I, I, I do I, believe. I reckon you get north of 4 Yeah. Mm. Yep. There'll be some money for some of the Australians, and he's a horse who hasn't been to Australia. I, I, I reckon you'll get four fifty for him. I what about for you? Wait. The, my bet was going to be Majestic Man each way. Um, after this morning, I think Winterfell's in the zone. And, and on all honesty, I think he'll win. So um, you're happy to be on him? Well, I'm happy, I'm happy about a dollar ninety. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he got to a dollar sixty because I think there's a whole bunch of really good horses on the second line, but no one's going to want to back them because barrier draws being barrier draws. I don't think he's over the line, but I, I think if, unless he underperforms, he can win. But I do think that that early pressure means we're going to have a real horse race. This is not going to be a doddle. And that's, that, that's, that's good because the whole series hasn't been. Mm, it no. deserves to be a good race. What about for you? Yeah, I'm quite happy to be on Temporale for a play. Again, we're playing into top four. Mm. And he is absolutely a horse that'll one love the 2700. He's already been a 3200 metre winner of the Road Cup. And a hot speed is exactly what he needs. Now... It's half a school for me that Big Jack Hammer and Majestic Man will come out that hard. There might even be a chance, if he wants to come off the fence, to do so. Maybe not. Maybe, Are you working maybe like it could a scenario, happen. a bit like Copy That did the other yeah, night? Yeah, a little, little bit the like second that. Road, exactly comes, like through, that. comes round. Probably the pressure out wide may negate that. May way. not be. Yeah. That opportunity might not be there. But we didn't think Copy That would have that. If, if no, they're going to go either. 320 against the market bigs, which we're thinking they might. And let's be honest, it's, al it's almost hard to go much slower these days with these good horses than that. Then 
th there'll be gaps coming. Yes. And if you want anybody who's ever driven at Alexandra Park ever to find those gaps, Tim Pramale has got the right fella. Yeah, he has. A.G. Hurler he. Short break for us. When we come back, we'll wrap it all up as we build towards a massive weekend of harness racing both Friday and Saturday night at the park. You're in your home straight with uh, Woodland Stud on the box seat. $120,000 for the pick six. Manawatu, nine races there, 508. And of course, the completion of the uh, two nights there, including the Australasian Young Drivers Championship. Addington Raceway, 10 races Friday night. $25,000 fast track insurance, a pick six there. And a bonus back on races one and two if you're on second or third, of course. Uh, Brick and Farms Young Guns Heat on Friday night. The Big Fish will be there, eight races, and a $5,000 bonus early quaddy there. Well, let's get to the park. Saturday night, we have both Inter Dominion Grand Finals, the Group 1 Peter Bricken Memorial uh, Caduceus Club Stakes. Uh, we have the Rosslyn Stud Queen of Hearts at Group 1 level, the Group 2 Alabar Three Roll Classic, and a $10,000 bonus first four on both Inter Dominion Finals. And of course, they're paying back to fourth on races six and eight, and bonus back on races one and two. Oh, and by the Second, way, third and fourth. So, so for sure, Nosca Bonavina want to rock up Yeah, they're just well. going to turn and up the there. Carrara Sunday, it's the Fast Track Insurance Akaroa Cup. 4.28 will be the start time there. 11 races there, and Winton race two. So a double header there on Sunday if you haven't had enough harness racing by then. And Forbury Park will be there on Wednesday. Nine races, nine minutes past five there. Here's what Mark Purden had to say, speaking of the undercard, around uh, their other charges on the night. Before we saw the Inter Dominion horses out, we saw Enhance Your Calm work, uh, working with Oscar Bonavina. Good work from both, but I thought Oscar Bonavina looked like he might have been covered. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, they're both very nice trotters, and uh, you know they, they're both good open company trotters, I would say. And but Oscar's probably just got the measure of um, Enhance Your Calm at the moment. Mark, a very good bunch of three-year-olds uh, in this weekend. First amazing dream, beaten in a very quick time last week, but a better draw Saturday night. Are you expecting a fitter version of her? I thought she was very good last week, Mick. I, don't, I don't, wouldn't say she's any better this week, but she's got a much better draw, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, Nat will take advantage of that, and certainly if she were led or was handy, she'd, she'd be the one to beat. We saw flying even better in one change work this morning with Winterfell. Um, one good draw, one not so good draw, up against quite a nice bunch of three-year-olds. What do you make of the Alabar this weekend? Uh, it'll be an interesting race. It's not a big field, but um, I've got a lot of respect for Ray Green's horse in there, and uh, he'll be the hardest to beat again, I'd say. Um, Smoothie will probably need the run, but flying even better, he would go another very good race, I'd say, and and uh, one change will probably need a little bit of ruck and, luck and running from an outside draw. Mark, for those looking forward to the Auckland Cup meeting, uh, I believe Self Assured's heading there. For the Inter Dominion horses who have had quite a busy month, will you make your decision after Saturday night about who does head to the Auckland Cup? Uh, we will make a final decision after that. Mick, yes, I, I'm picking like a horse like Cruz Bromac, who's enjoyed the racing this way round, and, and the fixer, there'd be probably two that'd be definite. And a big thank you to Mark Purden and the All-Stars team for allowing us access to them this morning. And nice work from the brand getting out there nice and early uh, this morning. All right, let's go to the Woodlands winner from last week. And it was Glenn Elgin Thompson by Highview Tommy. He had two winners on the day. Refine was a winner as well. This one owned by Hazel Van Opsyland, which was really nice because, of course, she part-owned Highview Tommy and she was on course to see this guy when she he's now She loves Highview Tommy more than I love pizza and beer. Yep, she does. She loves and, them a lot. Well, she races this one on her own. So congratulations to you, Hazel. And uh, I know Blair Orange was pretty wrapped to be driving this one as, of course, he drove uh, Highview Tommy pretty much throughout. What about the Australasian Young Drivers uh, Championship? 
Wow, there was a real turnaround yesterday, Craig Thompson, because Sarah O'Reilly has got past Cam Hart, who was three from three. He couldn't get one to go, Cam. Uh, I think two of them pulled up and the other one finished second to last. So Sarah had a great day. She actually had a really good book of drives tomorrow night. That pick six will go close to, I reckon, 150 to 200,000 tomorrow. And of course, there's three heats tomorrow, and I think they've got one more on Friday at Alexandra Park. All right, so the whale watch to look forward to this week. Do we have it at... Manawatu the second yeah, night? Yeah, Manawatu for uh, tomorrow night and then of course uh, the uh, two meetings at Auckland and then into Winton, very keen on a couple there on Sunday. Just right. talking about this morning too, it, was, it wasn't just about the All-Stars at Pukekohe, lots of horses working. Copy that worked really well. Uh, copy that Ray Green drove against lineup um, and Hampton Banner and worked really well. He's going to take a stack of beating in the Alabar Classic on Friday, uh, Saturday night. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what, just quickly, very much Young Guns Heat 2 Friday night. It's going to be worth looking forward to all these debut runners. We've seen them uh, trial in the last couple of weeks. I think there's four from the South Island. Uh, of course, uh, Paul Court's got one. Crandall Gideon, the All-Stars have got a couple taking on the North Best. So that's going to be a highlight Friday night. OK, tips for the Inter-Dominion Grand Finals. Well, we go to the Pacers uh, final. Oh, well, that was pretty straightforward, wasn't it? <laughs> um, um, mm. Ultimate sniper for the Ratinator. Talking to Natalie Rasmussen this morning. Natalie Rasmussen this morning. She said she gets a bit of a abuse online sometimes. She said if people can abuse me online, I want them to use my new online name, which is the Ratinator. Okay. So that's what she would like to be okay. known as if you're going to abuse your online, which you probably shouldn't do because it's not pretty nice. All right, let's go to the trotting final, and uh, there's a couple of different schools of thought here. Stacey White's gone for Mark Cooler, as has. Matthew Cross, and Majestic Man for the Big Fish. The rest of us are on the favourite, Michael. Look, you can make a case if you want to, if you wait for the tote for Majestic Man. If you're thinking, yeah, I want Winterfell, $2, $1.90, you can back him now, you can wait for the tote, you can back both and make a profit if you think they're going to be lead and trail. The pacing final may be a little bit harder to make that profit on, boys. All right, really appreciate your input and your efforts this morning. And to you, Craig, looking forward to working with you again leading into uh, Saturday night and, of course, the big night. We've got plenty of other really strong races in the support card, but a lot of short price favourites. A lot of short price. I reckon six under $2, Greg. But I'm, what I'm looking forward to is the newcomers, the Oscars and the self-assureds turning up there on Saturday night. It's going to be a great night. We'll talk about it Friday night prior and at the park. Yep, we certainly will. That's been your box seat with Woodland Stud. Hope you've enjoyed the preview of the IRT Inter-Dominion 2019. We will all see you on Saturday night.